This week, tech driven by women, designed by women, and designed for women. Oh dear. The children at this North London school have invited Lara and me to learn about one of the most important events in British history. It's been a hundred years since the first women in the UK were able to vote in a general election. And this VR experience is attempting to demonstrate how important it is to make your voice heard. And now, repeat after me. This is my voice. Before the suffragettes, a woman had to know her place. Make Noise is an eight-minute uh, interactive animated documentary story which uh, you use your voice to interact with, and it's about the story of the suffragettes. I walked down the Strand, and the first shop I came to, which was a jeweler's, bang, and I hammer through the window. In the early 20th century, the British suffragette movement fought for the right of women to vote by protesting and damaging buildings, all the while facing ridicule and anger in the media. Sing a note and make a monument with your voice. Hold it for as long as you can. That's something that seemed to resonate with everyone in the room. Yes, it did make me feel quite self-conscious to simply make noise, but that was the whole point for both the female and maybe more importantly, male participants, reminding everyone of the importance of their voice being heard and valued. So what did you think of the experience today? Crazy cool and epic. How much of a difference do you think it made learning about a subject like this in VR? It was actually quite helpful because now I actually know more about history compared to like other games. It's in a form that like us kids now we can understand it rather than looking at old footage which will like make it seem as if it's boring but if we see it this way it's more fun to watch. When we think about the suffragettes we think about these women in their like very kind of starched, neat clothing and we just think they're not us. And actually when you hear what they say and the way that they say it and they're giggling and they're punk as hell, you think, okay, actually you can teach me something about how I need to be now. This isn't just about them. Do you think that men and women are equal now? They're not equal. In what ways? Men still get paid more than women. Look at the buckets one by one and call out the names of the women who've inspired you. My mum, My mum. They seem very excited when they could shout out the names of women who'd inspired them. Yeah. Who were yours? Um, well, I'm only here because of Tomorrow's World, the BBC Science Programme, and so Maggie Philbin and Judith Hahn. ...before it can ever fly again. Sadly, we may now have taken a step backwards in terms of female figures in technology. The 1970s saw the invention of the computer-driven word processor built by Evelyn Berezin, who died this week at the age of 93. In the 80s, almost 40% of American computer science majors were women, but by 2012, this number had halved. Today, in Silicon Valley, the heart of tech innovation, women only make up a quarter of the workforce. And female founders, on average, get less than half the investment of their male counterparts. That's maybe not surprising when you hear that only 7% of investors are women. So with stats like these, we end up living in a world where most things are still designed by men, even if they are designed for women. Case in point, this audio interface was recently being marketed specifically to women. Great, isn't it? 
the company has since apologised. For a long time, the advertising world thought that any piece of tech could be adapted to the female market just by shrinking it and pinking it. In London's Design Museum, I presented researcher in feminist science and tech Sarah Kemba with one such honking example. May I interest you in a pink round phone that's basically a makeup mirror with it's, some buttons on it? Yeah, it to resemble a, a kind of powder compact or yeah. whatever it was. That's quite okay. Do you think that this would have been used practically by women, or do you think this might be something that's designed by a man who thinks they know what a woman I think generally want. speaking you can see that it is designed for an idea of, of, of women. Some I mean, women are going to fancy even, that. You can't even see the middle of the mirror though, look, because there's a screen yeah, in the it's way. Not, it's it's like... not perhaps as practical as it seems. <laughs> uh, pink is just a, a, a way of linking to gender. It's a bit of a shorthand. Not all women like pink, clearly. Yeah. It's a marketing strategy. And even with something as critical as artificial hearts, women have been overlooked for a long time. Their design was based on larger hearts that typically fit men and only a fifth of female patients. Only now are smaller ones being developed. And unbelievably, car crash testing was performed only on male dummies up until a few years ago, resulting in 50% more injuries to female passengers even with a seatbelt on. But even when things are designed exclusively for women, they may not end up being particularly comfortable. The traditional breast pump is the epitome of how awful technology can be designed for women. So Tanya Bowler went on to design this, a new style pump. It's called LV and it fits into a nursing bra and is operated by an app. The design was based on her own past experiences as a nursing mother. I don't know if you're familiar with a breast pump, but when I used it, it's painful, it's big, it's cumbersome, it's noisy. Women often say they feel like cows because they're just so embarrassed to use this outdated piece of equipment. I genuinely believe that if men were using the traditional breast pump, they would have redesigned it a long time ago. But again, because it's for women and it's an intimate issue that nobody talks about, it's been completely neglected. So I met up with someone who's recently had a baby and has been testing the device. Getting the latch right and the, the sensation and all of those elements, um, it, would, it would need to have been someone that have breastfed. The sensation and, and, and the usability would need to have been, um, you know, understandably designed by a woman. For a busy mom like me with two older kids and to have to run a business, it's just a dream come true. And it can be subtle differences in elements of the design that make a product feel more personal. OK, well, let's get personal now with some digital assistance. But what gender do these personal servants assume? Starting potato, six minutes, 34 seconds. OK, Google, what's the weather going to be like today? In London today, there will be showers with a forecast high of 13 and a low of 12. And here we have the latest Apple iPad in its default setting. Hey Siri, what's the weather going to be like? Here's the weather today. Yep. So Apple are now defaulting in some cases at least to a, a male voice. Cortana, what gender are you? I am digital. Yeah, but really you're female, aren't you? Because that's a female voice. Right, yeah? that's the point. Uh, when these various uh, voices were devised, they were deliberately devised to be female because the companies in question uh, spoke to their consumers and their consumers told them, look, you know, if we've got something that's an assistant, we would expect it to be female and friendly. These are the kind of avatars developed by some of the biggest companies in the world. Answer Lab is an outfit in San Francisco that road tests potential digital assistants. Now, the problem we run into with having uh, so many uh, avatars as women is when they reinforce the stereotypes, but also they're so hard to get right. So you probably have noticed that the world is very critical of what women look like. The world is critical of how women speak. So when we look at avatars being made as women, we have to ask ourselves, what are the ethical implications for always making them in this style? What does this reinforce in terms of stereotypes in our society? If we look at society as a whole across uh, many, many, many spectrums, uh, we tend to see women playing roles that these assistants 
Innocence would play for women, so it's natural that people will often ask for this. But how happy are customers, especially female ones, with these kind of decisions? Anytime a brand tends to uh, over-stereotype what a female avatar would look like, where she may, they may make her too submissive, that tends to really turn off women who say, hey, this isn't how we want to interact with a brand or how the, we want the brand to represent itself to us. And it's that diversity that AI has the potential to offer us. Lately, though, it's come under scrutiny for doing the exact opposite and instead reinforcing inbuilt biases. It's been really interesting over the last few weeks to see what happened with Amazon, for example. So Amazon deployed an AI-driven system, a software, to make decisions around recruitment. But funnily enough, all the CVs that they were choosing, they were of men. So they had to stop using their software. So of course, there are serious issues around bias and fairness of algorithms, which can be mitigated with a different, in two different ways. There is of course the data set, because artificial intelligence is based on historic data. So of course, historic data mirror what the situation is right now. So if attention is not put in, in the choice of data and put it in the system, then the outcome would be a biased outcome. Many startups working on AI recruitment tools explicitly sell their services as a way to avoid biases. And Amazon now say they are working on an AI recruitment tool, this time with a focus on diversity. We need girls, we need women doing design, doing tech, but we really need to understand what we mean by design and tech and that it's all, always a social practice. It's about our future and it's about how we deploy AI in a way that in a way which is equitable for everyone but also doesn't turn stereotypes which are already in society right now into prejudice which are ultimately much more difficult to eradicate. I think it's sometimes tempting to believe the chatter that we are making progress in the area of gender equality in tech, but the truth is that we've still got miles to go, haven't we? Absolutely, and statistics from both the US and the UK suggest that there's a lower proportion of women working in tech than there had been. <sighs> but I think something that really became apparent, actually, when making that film was that talking to people, there seems to be a general opinion that men and women do think differently. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to design, putting both together should come up with the best results. So that equality is really important. Let's do it, people. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week in which the NHS decided it really shouldn't be buying any more fax machines. Meghan Markle was named the most Googled woman in the UK for the second year running. And another bug was discovered in Google+. The flaw has led to Google deciding to shut down the service earlier than planned in April. Busy week for Google as its chief exec, Sundar Pichai, appeared before the House Judiciary Committee in the States. He faced accusations of political bias. The boss was also asked why if you Google the word idiot in the images section, Donald Trump shows up. His answer, it's all about the algorithms. Hmm. It was also the week in which US football team, the Denver Broncos, showed off a robot bartender for its fans. Although that pint looks like it's left a bit to be desired. Virgin Galactic has put its passenger craft carrying two pilots into space. It flew 82 kilometers up. That's the highest a commercial vehicle carrying humans has ever gone. And finally, it was the week in which Russian state TV was fooled by a robot. This bot stole the tech show held just north of Moscow, but it wasn't the droid Russia 24 was looking for. The broadcaster and quite a few others were fooled, but keen social media watchers weren't, as they spotted the movements weren't so much Boston Dynamics and more human boogie woogie. Sly moves. Now, if the tech industry has issues with gender balance, you want to take a look at the maritime world, where just 2% of seafarers are female. Emily Bates has been to snowy Turku in Finland, land of a thousand lakes, to track down a female captain whose career is about to be transformed by technology. There are many of them, and then there are just a few, few ladies on board. But uh, yeah, 
if you do, if you do your job well, then it shouldn't be a problem. Anu loved her life at sea, working her way up the ranks over many years. But once she started a family, she found it increasingly difficult. Oh no! Going away. The children don't understand why, where she is and why, why is she so long time away. So it wasn't easy. It became kind of obvious that I need to have a shore-based job to continue. I wouldn't want to miss them growing up. But new tech may allow Anu to continue her career at sea while still coming home to her family each night. I went to Turku to get on board what is being called the future of shipping. Ships like these make up part of Finland's road network and complete millions of journeys every year. And I'm about to get on one that doesn't have a driver. This ship has been retrofitted with a variety of sensors and cameras which allow it to navigate by itself. It can set sail, complete the crossing and even dock itself, all without any human intervention. Anu has been heavily involved in the development of the tech. We have uh, object detection, which is uh, done by our intelligent awareness system, which is doing uh, sensor fusion. It's using AIS radar and camera to detect an object. This information is going to the autonomous navigation system, which is then the brains, who is kind of deciding whether these objects are dangerous for the vessel or not, and if we need to avoid them. So one of these little boats here, we're making sure we don't hit yeah. it, basically. Yeah, <laughs> we, are. we are. And we haven't hit it, which is always good, so it's working. <laughs> During testing, there's still a crew for safety, but it's a bit eerie knowing no one is in control. While ship's captains like Anu won't eventually be on board, they will be piloting multiple craft from the shore. Should something go wrong with an autonomous vessel, one of these places will be able to take control of it from onshore and steer it to safety, no matter where it was in the world. Rolls-Royce, who is behind the technology, believes in under 20 years, ultimately we'll see unmanned, fully autonomous ships crossing our oceans. Jobs are as ever one concern, but as with any piece of connected tech, a big worry is cybersecurity. What we have done is we have really put a lot of effort into cybersecurity from the very beginning of our remote autonomous development. I guess the other thing that immediately springs to mind is piracy. We can try to make it hard for pirates to get on board, but probably at some point they can enter the vessel. Uh, what you do then is, of course, you don't allow them to take control of the vessel. By not giving the access to the system, they basically cannot steer the vessel. So the only, their only option is actually to dis, uh, disable the machinery and stop the vessel. And having a ship floating in the middle of the ocean without propulsion is not easy. This technology may never be a substitute for the romance of the sea, but it could let people like Anu balance the life they want using their years of training and expertise with family life. <laughs> yeah, it's worth it. You can see them every day and uh, enjoy this kind of life as well. Welcome to Robotex, a huge robotics festival this year held in Tallinn, Estonia. Participants from 46 countries are vying to win €100,000 in prize money to develop their robotic prototype further. Uh, if you want, uh, please come here. Yes, hiding amidst the wonders, wires and Wi-Fi connected devices here are one team of teenage girls who have really made it against all odds. Afghanistan, a country in turmoil. Leading an ordinary life in this war-ravaged country is hard, especially if you're female. It's been described as the worst place on earth to be a woman. 
Kabul's Babar Gardens were lit up this week to mark the close of the UN's 16 days of activism to end gender-based violence. Yet in the western city of Herat, this group of teenage girls cast aside day-to-day -day concerns over safety, security and mere survival to do something that most girls in this country can only dream of. Aptly, they are known as the Afghan Dreamers. Every child has a dream. Robotics became mine when I watched cartoons with robots as a six-year-old kid. Seeing them walking and talking like humans made me think about how they're built and what makes them different from us. Every week they get together to code and build robots. Their inventions trying to find solutions to very local problems. More than 80% of the Afghan population works in agriculture, which is still a very manual process here. We would like to change that. Our bot can cut wheat and handle the first process, and eventually we would like it to separate the wheat as well, making things easier for the farmer. Fatima is the team leader. Unusually, her father had greatly encouraged her, only tragically, she lost him last year in a suicide bombing, a stark reminder of life here. The girls won last year's prestigious Robotex contest in Estonia, and that gave them the chance to be able to better their device. So this year, they've gone back with the improved version, hoping that they could win the big money prize on offer this time round. Congratulations on reaching the final of the competition. How are you feeling? I'm so excited for this. So we have in here two robots. So as you know, Zafran is so famous in Afghanistan. So it's hard for women collecting the Zafran by their hand. So with this robot, we can help them to collecting all the Zafran uh, easier than by hand. We can cut the uh, Zafran in here and then we have a process in here. We can do process and then in here we have an elevator that it's all Zafran can go in here. From there, they can be packaged and transported by the other robot. As a girl interested in robotics in Afghanistan, what challenges are you up against? Uh, the big challenge is about that, that uh, some families don't allow their girls to go to a uh, robotic uh, section uh, because they think the uh, girls, uh, girl is just for home. Uh, and I think it's uh, wrong because girls can be like men so to do something. I want to be a mechanical engineer in the future and I want to help my country to improve um, their like customs, whatever they want, so I want to help them. The team's mentor is one of Afghanistan's first female tech founders who's running the Digital Citizen Fund, a non-profit aimed at empowering women. You still face with lots of the challenge, is with the uh, culture problems, security, and many story types. And sometimes I think that when you have a confidence, I don't need to tell to the men that I'm an engineer. They have to believe I am an engineer. I don't need to explain to them. And uh, we work on our projects and we prove with actions. We don't need to talk. Whilst change won't come overnight, we may be seeing the dawn of a generation who want to think anything is possible. And surely that's a start. Wow, that is such an inspiring story. Brilliant, brilliant. Absolutely, it really was. But sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. If you want to keep up with the team between programmes, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. At BBC Click. On Instagram. At BBC Click. On YouTube.com forward slash. BBC Click. Thanks for watching. See you soon.